So once again, thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed your tea and coffee. There'll be lunch served straight after the session. You know, I've always had the utmost respect for scientists because they say that anyone that can heal you can kill you. <laughs> so I'm really honored to be part of a community of people who are all about creating solutions through uh, innovation and technology and seeing how we can move the nation and the world forward. So without further ado, in this section of the program, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be focusing on really the critical bottleneck and the solutions to the commercialization of research in the region and also just engaging on how we can learn from one another as uh, different countries. So I urge you to please engage on Twitter. Keep your phones on silent, uh, please, but do throw in your questions and your comments where possible and hashtag uh, NEPAD San Bio, and you can also tag uh, at uh, NEPAD San Bio as well as um, at CSIR on Twitter or CSIR South Africa on Instagram. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome to the platform our first speaker who will then introduce the panel discussion, but I will invite everyone on the stage, the speaker and the panelists all at the same time. And I would like for the panelists to please join us and take a seat to your right and uh, for the speaker to please come up to the platform and, and take the podium. So please help me to welcome our facilitator for this session, Dr. Sean Moolman from Power Optical South Africa. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you very much. And on that note, I would uh, love to welcome Professor Michael Wallach to the platform. If you may have a seat, a round of applause for Professor Michael Wallach, as well as Mr. Vincent Noah Seb as well. Professor Michael is from the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, and Mr. Vincent Noah Seb is the National Commission on Research Science and Technology in Namibia. Our third panelist, Ms. Pauline Mujawamaria Colby, is from the African Innovation Foundation in Geneva. A round of applause for her, please. <laughs> Dr. Margot Bagley from the Emory University in the United States of America. A round of applause for her. <laughs> Last but not least, if Ms. Ella Romanowska from the University of Witz, right here in South Africa, can join us. A round of applause for you. Thank you. Could we get, could we, is there another roving mic or can I give them this one? All right, I can give them this one. But you need, are you mic? I'd like to sit there as well if you want. Oh, sure. <laughs> He'd love to sit down. So um, it's really an honor and a privilege to facilitate this session. I think the focus is really on the, on the really at the core of, of all our endeavors, and that is how to translate uh, research into practice. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, Dr. Chakauya earlier mentioned uh, making money, because generally if you speak to people in academia and professors and people that have um, decided that they, they want to devote their whole life to, to the betterment of society through, through research and development and, and science, generally they're quite averse to the thought of making money and, and, and a bit allergic to it. But I think the key, is, the key to realize is that um, the, the other side of w when an endeavor is making money, the flip side of that is that it, that means that it is sustainable. And sustainability is key to continuing to deliver value. So I think we have to get over that, uh, over that um, uh, false uh, divide that we've seen between, between being able to do good for humankind and making money at the same time. Um, and, you know, social entrepreneurship and all these things come in as well, and I hope we can uh, dig a little bit into that as well. Um, we have a really uh, distinguished panel here. Um, just to say how the session is going to run. First, we, we have 
Dr. Dagbe Nyan, is that you? Yes. yes. Um, he will come up and he will, I think he will do a presentation, but he will tell you a little bit about, uh, he's a Liberian uh, uh, researcher and scientist um, and engineer. Sorry, I'm, that's not correct. Um, but he, he has studied in the US and he's, um, he's developed a technology um, to, uh, to dif simultaneous dif simultaneously differentiate at least three to seven infections at the same time within 10 to 40 minutes. And this is something that is developed in the lab and that is now started a business around. And so we want to hear a little bit about the entrepreneurial journey and also about his perspective as an African researcher uh, in terms of the support structures. He spent some time in the US, I think, is the business based in the US and in South Africa? Oh, sorry, and in uh, Liberia. 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 So we want to hear a bit about the Liberian environment and also the international perspective. Um, and after, after that, we'll, we'll give the audience, um, we want to make it a participation. So we'll give you some time to ask him questions, but also to engage and to engage in a discussion with him. And if some of you are trying, are, are, are trying the same thing or thinking of the same thing, we'd like to hear from you as well. And, and hear different uh, perspectives and have a conversation about that. So after that, um, Dr. Nyan, it will be good if you can join the, the panel as well after that. We, we'll then have a panel discussion about the key issues in terms of translating research uh, uh, into, into practice and, and deriving and delivering value from that. Um, I'll, I'll introduce the panel um, now. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Nyan and then the panel. Um, so, and then uh, that will be a 30 minute discussion and after that we'll also give time uh, for the audience to engage with our panelists and, and to have a conversation. Um, and we'll see if we can, of course we can't solve um, all the issues in one day, but um, the idea is that it's a continual and a continuation of the conversation and every time we speak we, we, we build a stronger uh, understanding of how we, how we can do this in the African context. Um, and uh, when I tell you the, the backgrounds of the panelists, you will see that we have a very good diversity, uh, both from, from a, a country perspective, but also from the type of institution and the type of background and experience that our panelists have. So I'll just introduce uh, Dr. Nyan and then the panelists, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Nyan. Um, so uh, Dr. Dagpe Nyan is a medical doctor a biomedical research scientist, an inventor, and a social activist. He studied zoology and chemistry, and he earned a degree in human medicine in infectious diseases in Germany. Um, he was later trained as a biomedical scientist at the National Institutes of Health in the US. Dagwe ha has developed a rapid test that I mentioned earlier, and I think he'll tell us a bit, little bit more about that um, just now. Uh, then we have Professor Michael Wallach. He's the uh, Associate Head of School of the School of Life Sciences at the University of Technology, Sydney. But he also runs a program called SPARC, which is uh, from Stanford University and has now spread to several countries around the world and is uh, focused specifically on translational, translation of biomedical research into practice. So I think that that brings a, an interesting international perspective uh, to what we're talking about today as well. Um, so. Uh, uh, Professor Wallach has over 25 years of experience in basic and applied molecular parasitology. I think like many of us, he's also a scientist at art and, and keeps, keeps that very close to his art and still tries to do a little bit of that even though it's become very difficult. Um, so he's published over 60 papers in his field and he has been invited uh, to talk at many international conferences. He's also a, a core member of CBSI, which is the Center for Business and Social Innovation in Australia. And I, just from the brief discussions we've had, I've seen that he, he, he has a very strong uh, personal uh, belief and interest in, in uh, African development and in spreading uh, um, ideas and, and improving uh, health across the globe. So we look forward to engaging with him on that. Um, then we have Mr. Vincent Nowasep. He is the General Manager for Innovation and Technology Development at the National Commission on Research Science and Technology in Namibia. He's a graduate of Manchester, Manchester University, having studied uh, MSc in Biotechnology and Entrepreneurship, and he's the former manager of Biotechnology at NCRST. 
Uh, NCRST's mandate is to promote and develop research, science and technology across all disciplines. It's the main funding body of R&D in Namibia and so I think, uh, I think um, Vincent will be able to bring us a policy perspective on translating uh, biomedical research into, into innovation and commercializing. Um, then we have Ms. Pauline Mujama Maria Kovo, and uh, she's the Managing Director of Africa Innovation Foundation based in Geneva. Um, this is a, a, a pan-African program for um, uh, promoting innovation in Africa and showcasing innovation uh, from the continent across the globe, uh, a growing interest in innovation and, and our shared belief that Africa can be uh, a, a very rich source of innovation and contribution to, to the global uh, community. So she's uh, also program director of the Innovation Prize for Africa and Innovation Ecosystems. Um, she, she joined AIF in July 2011. She works towards catalyzing market-orientated solutions for African-led development across the continent, building innovation ecosystems that will invigorate economic growth across Africa. I think that's a, that's a shared goal from, uh, of all of us. Then we also honor to have Professor Margot Bagley of Emory University in the US. She uh, is a, a professor in patent law. Um, she's the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University School of Law. Um, she, she served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on University Management of Intellectual Property. And she's a member of many uh, very prestigious global bodies, including the Convention on Biological Diversity's Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group on Digital Sequence Information and Genetic Resources. Um, she's, she's also served as a consultant to the Food and Agricultural Organization's International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and, Agricultural, for food and Agriculture Secretariat. She also helped create uh, an award-winning Georgia, Georgia Tech and Emory University, I think it's Tiger, is that how you pronounce it, uh, entrepreneurship program, and she's taught international comparative patent law courses in Germany, Israel, Cuba, Singapore, and China. Um, so I think that sort of very, very broad global uh, exposure uh, brings another unique perspective. Uh, and I think she's also been involved in some of the Emory programs in South Africa and Africa in general. And so she's had some sight of the intellectual property environment and the innovation uh, ecosystem here as well and can bring uh, an inter interesting perspective to that. And then last but definitely not least is uh, Ms. Ella Romanowska, she's the Director of Innovation of, at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, uh, and that's in the wholly owned subsidiary called WITS Enterprise. Um, and they are responsible for the whole university's technology transfer, commercialization, intellectual property management, uh, and so forth. And she's worked in many different parts of the South African innovation ecosystem and, and can bring a very rich experience from that including uh, the old innovation fund that a lot of you might be familiar with that then became the Technology Innovation Agency. Um, and she's also currently the president of CERIMA, which, is, which many of you might be familiar with. It's the Southern African Research and Innovation Management Association, which is a Southern African initiative to, to grow the, the, the professionalism uh, or to professionalize and grow the knowledge and insight and the strength of research management and innovation management in Southern Africa. So I think if you can join me in a hand of applause uh, for the panel. Um, so then I'd like to hand over to Dr. Dr. Doug Ben Yan. So uh, Winston Churchill had a saying that uh, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Yeah. And I think that about sums up uh, the general entrepreneurial journey. So I think you can tell us a little bit more about that. Do you want to? Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very warm introduction of the panelists and Thank you all for taking up your precious time to come to collaborate with each other uh, in order to cross-fertilize ideas. 
um, entrepreneurship is not a unique area, but it is unique in itself. Everything that happens in the area of entrepreneurship happens to each and every one of us in life. So there are good days, there are bad days, there are failures, there are success. And so everything, uh, as the Europeans would say, is a goulash. You find everything in there. Uh, my journey started when I was released from prison as a political prisoner in Liberia, uh, having fought for genuine democracy during the period of the military rule in the 80s, uh, arrested, put to prison. Now, in prison, you know that's a tropical country, right? It was during the rainy season, and the mosquitoes are very happy. Uh, mosquitoes, as you know, they are vectors of a lot of diseases. Malaria is one. And so you are bitten by malaria because it's a form of torture also. And there's no way you can be taken to hospital because you are a prisoner. And then, after being released, security issues. And so you have to go into exile. And that's how I ended up in Germany, in Europe. <laughs> so, um, after medical school or during medical school, my focus then was, what is it that I can learn and take back on the African continent that will be beneficial? Not only to Africa, not only to Liberia, but across the globe. Because we are all interconnected. Uh, today, we see cross-border transmission of diseases. And so, I began to focus in that direction earlier during my career. And so, I took on gastroenterology. But in the process, I know we have a lot of gastroenterological infectious diseases, MR, which is like dysentery, for example, uh, cholera, which will give you a lot of the runny stomach and stuff like that. And as we continue, I decided then, look at a particular phenomenon that is across Africa and across the world. At the time, of course, HIV was a death sentence. Then hepatitis viruses, very prevalent in every part of Africa. And of course, the world because HIV was across the world. And so I began to formulate my thoughts. After graduation, practice for a while, I then went, uh, was recruited by the National Institute of Health in the United States. And then um, began to concentrate on one aspect of infectious disease. You know, you're given a project, as we said during our summer school, but you can, and that's where the innovation comes in. You can utilize that opportunity that is before you to generate other opportunities. So being charged with the responsibility of developing the first mouse model of Helicobacter pylori infection, Helicobacter which infects the stomach, uh, it is the known causative agent of all sorts of diseases today. I'm glad my Australian friend here probably knows the story about Barry Marshall, uh, who discovered all sorts of uh, uh, Helicobacter pylori. Um, and he was an inspiration, told me, from his story. Uh, this is a young graduate out of medical school into pathology. And every time he looks in the microscope, you will see these curved spiral organisms. Every time, the old adage was, all sorts is caused by stress. All sorts is caused by stress. You know, in the scientific and medical world, things become a dogma. And to change them sometimes become very difficult. Sometimes we think bureaucrats and policymakers are difficult, but sometimes scientists are really difficult. So, <laughs> And nobody believed him. In fact, he was, you know, kind of castigated. And it happened to some of us. 
So, one time, he was trying to grow it so that uh, he can prove that this is, the, this is the bacteria that is causing this. Because you have to show it, you have to show proof. You have to show evidence, you know, in a scientific world. Without that, nobody believes you. And he left the plate out on an Easter holiday. When he came back, he saw this tiny stuff growing on a plate. Because the bacteria are very hard to grow. You know, it's not like E. coli, as soon as you pull it in a broth, you know, you scientists, within six, seven hours, you get your growth. So when he came back, he saw that, he marked it up and looked at it. And that was one of his evidences. So it didn't stop there. They still did not believe him. And so what did he do? Today we talk about animals experimentation and people are using animals for experiment. But we as humans, we use ourselves for experiments all the time. So what he decided to do was, okay, since they don't believe me, I am going to drink it and they will see me with the symptoms and then they will believe me. I mean, that's the length scientists go through sometimes. And so he took a breath of it and when they did the endoscopy, they definitely saw it, you know, in his stomach, and it was verified. That's how. After all of those years, he finally won a Nobel Prize for all of what he did. I was fortunate to have met him when I did the diagnosis for Helicobacter pylori using this tool. At the time, when I proposed to my bosses at the NIH, at the National Institute of Health, that we don't always have to use endoscopy to look into, you know, the gastric environment. It is uncomfortable for the patient. We don't have to use C-urea breath test. It's one of the tests because it has radioactive material. So there's a simple way that we could probably do that. Why can't we use the stool? If it is a gastrointestinal disease, probably we could see it in the stool. Say, so, no, it's hard. It's not like E. coli that, you know, or like... Uh, those that cause uh, the cholera, you know, vibrio cholera that you can easily detect in a stool. But again, when I performed the test, my role was just to design how it infects you, not how you detect it. But I transformed that into looking at how you also detect it, because if I have the system in me, that gives me the possibility. And so when I detected it, they didn't believe it until we had to do several experiments, and another lab came in, collaborators, when the experiment was finally done, independent experiment. And the guy came and told my boss, he said, we got it. <laughs> and that was mind break. And that was when I went to Australia in 1999 at the uh, European Gastroenterology uh, Conference to present these results as my first invention of uh, uh, detecting Helicobacter pylori through the stool. And so, these are some of the difficulties, the hurdles, the good, the bad. The, the, you know, the, first we talk about the, the bad and the ugly, because that leads to the good. If you can persist, if you can persevere, if you can endure all of the difficulties, then the good comes. And so in the lab, we spent several days doing experiments, with negative results. And mind you, I always encourage my fellow colleagues that negative results are the best results because they always tell you what is not there and what you should be looking for. Don't always be happy when you get a positive result. Say, oh, we got it. You know, this is positive. We got it. So it's a guideline. And so... I think that is out of range. So I have already begun to tell you about some of the hurdles that all of us go through in life and as entrepreneur. At a time, from being in prison, affected with malaria through the NIH, I was not thinking about being an entrepreneur. All I was concentrating on was doing good science. What science can make it, uh, 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 can be valuable to human society? as a physician and as a scientist, taking the Hippocratic oath. So you see all of this, the doubt about your ideas, which I just talked about earlier. There will be doubt, you know. Our fellow colleagues will doubt you. And it is important because uh, it helps you to grow also. 
But you don't have to be discouraged. That alone should encourage you to move on. Because there are certain beliefs and certain convictions that we have as, as individuals and as scientists when you were working on a project. The, the next thing is, all of those things bring towards you an un, unjustifiable uncertainty. Why do I say that? Unjustifiable uncertainty because when you are doubted most of the time, you become uncertain of what you're doing if you're not you know, confident of yourself. But that uncertainty is unjustifiable because you know you have a conviction. And, and, and so uh, these are some of the issues that emotionally we have to contend with. And all of this happens also in entrepreneurship. And we will get there later. And during the period also, as a Liberian from Africa in the Western world, where in that social milieu in the United States, there is a stereotype about certain uh, racial classifications, certain social groups, certain minorities. And it happens day in and day out. So in the workplaces, in the laboratories, you, face, you are faced with these things. And so even when you have a good idea, nobody believes you because you come from a part of the world that is not known to be uh, scientifically bright, that is not known to be anything. So where are you coming from to tell us that this thing that you are seeing, this observation, is correct? So you are faced with these situations. As you know, it was verified by the major pronouncement by one of the world leaders as to how he thought about Africa, but that's not how we are. <laughs> In that sense, going through that, even before even going into entrepreneurship, as a postdoc, as a scientist, you are faced with the question of funding every time. So, Sometimes, how does your postdoctoral fellowship continue if you don't have funding, if the institution does not have funding? That also is something to learn during the process of that time because when you get to the stage of being an entrepreneur, you will be faced with that as well. So it, it, life situations, as I said, teaches us how the present life situation teaches us how to combat future or, or problems. And so you are faced with those. Another issue is bureaucratic hurdles. As a scientist, as a student, there are certain hurdles that you, you face, you know, in the dean's office, in certain papers, even your registration, you know, sometimes is delayed because there's some bureaucratic process you have to go through. Sometimes grants are delayed because of bureaucracy. Sometimes you don't get what you want because of certain bureaucracy. And this bureaucracy, are not only restricted in the, the, um, the scientific world or the scientific milieu, they are across into the, govern the governmental and governing structure of our states. If you compare that to the Europeans, for example, where, yes, there is bureaucracy, but they make resources available to their people. In our part of the world, we have this extreme bureaucracy that hinders a lot of progress that we should be making. And this bureaucracy, at some point in time, translates into corruption. And so the money we need to conduct science is into other people's pockets. And we are at the mercy of the Western world. And so we are always thankful, you know, to uh, Australia, to Finland, you know, that partners with us to, to share resources, to devote their resources. The United States uh, National Institute of Health, you know, the, the, the CDC, the FDA, FDA where I work later on, uh, which was my last stop before I ended my uh, 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 you know, postdoctoral and, and, and other professional career within that value. And so you have this bureaucracy. All of this is very time consuming because as we all know, you can invent, but if that invention does not make it on time, in the world where it is needed, you may lose out. So there's a time-consuming aspect 
not only in the experiments we do, but when we do the experiments and get the results, we cannot translate them. This, this question of from bench to bedside, from the laboratory bench to the hospital. So these, these, these good ideas are not translated for the benefit of humanity. So it, it becomes time consuming. And it, it creates its own emotional stress as well as uh, uh, career change. You know, so you, sometimes you say, well, I'd rather doing something that I was not trained for, and you change your career. But in the course of your development, you have to also understand that at the end of the day, whether you are in the lab, whether you are an entrepreneur, one major thing that becomes an issue is how you build your team, how you put your team together. Because you will have people of different orientation, different colorations, different ideas. But all of that, all of that diversity should be seen as a strength. It shouldn't be seen as a weakness. And it shouldn't be seen as something that will become divisive. So if in building your team, if you can take into consideration that particular aspect, you are on the way to becoming a good leader, not just as an entrepreneur, but somebody who is a good leader. This brings us to the problems that I identified then. During the Ebola crisis, I was at a time, all my fellowship at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Previously, I had worked at a biotech company where they asked me to develop a rapid test for hepatitis C. And I went, did the work with my research assistant, and we developed the test, the FDA approved it, and this company was making big money. So when the contract ended, my research associate went away, he went to another institution at the Naval Medical Research Center in the United States. And my contract ended. And he said, at the Naval Medical Research Center, they are looking for you know, scientists that can develop you know, a rapid diagnostic test for hepatitis C, HIV, and hepatitis B. He said, and I told them that I know a very good scientist who can do that because he just had an experience with that. So he contacted me. And that's how I joined the Naval Medical Research Center as a scientist. There, I worked on developing this rapid test for the detection of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C, as you will note for some of our physicians here, is a very silent killer. It does not show symptoms in the early stages. By the time it is diagnosed, it would have been far off. It leads into liver cirrhosis, it leads to liver cancer, leads to liver failure, ultimately death. HIV, we know the story of HIV. Thank God, today HIV is a chronic disease. It's, you know, it's no longer the killer disease that we taught, simply because of the science and technology that went into investigating and coming up with newer methods of treatment and newer drugs to combat it. And so, during the course of this time, when I work on this, then I came up with, wait a minute. If in Africa, for example, Liberia, where I come from, we have malaria, we have typhoid, we have uh, in Lhasa fever, which is also prevalent in uh, uh, Nigeria, then we have yellow fever. And all of these diseases present the same onset clinical symptoms. The first thing is high temperature, high fever. The next thing is nausea. You begin to vomit. And so you, you don't know, when you go to a physician, you don't know actually, and the physician, well-trained doctors, we begin to, what I term now, professionally guess as to what is happening to you until we can conduct the laboratory test. Because from the clinical symptomatology alone, you can immediately begin to give your diagnosis, suspect diagnosis, 
before the patient is sent to the clinic for, excuse me, to the laboratory for laboratory tests in order to confirm your diagnosis. Now, during the Ebola crisis, Ebola also came. Mind you, in 1976, there was the outbreak of Ebola in Zaire, and it killed a lot of people. From then on, Ebola became a, an issue on the African continent. It then spread out in the southern part of the continent also. There were cases in South Africa, cases in Zambia, sporadic cases. Now, diseases, particularly infectious diseases, know no borders. They require no passport to go anywhere. We are the carriers of diseases. And so, looking at cross-border transmission, when Ebola broke out, where did it come from? This particular virus is all the way in East Africa, East Central Africa. How did it come all the way to West Africa? So, epidemiologists then begin to ask these questions. But while you ask those questions, the virus is very virulent. It begins to dissipate lives. And so it, starting from Guinea, it crossed over into Liberia, into Sierra Leone. And that is a triangular region where you have the same ethnic group in all three countries right there. And you have the same situation where I think Zambia and a few other countries here, you know. So the borders are very porous. We still don't, up to this time, and I know you will bear with me too, we don't respect the colonial borders that were put in place. They are very poor. We pass through them every time. They are just there as demarcations. But so what I began to do then was Ebola then had the same symptom. So if Ebola is giving you symptoms like malaria, for example, the same high temperature, the same nausea, the same... Um, uh, 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 vomiting. How do you know whether this patient is infected with malaria or they're infected with Ebola or they're infected with typhoid fever? So my thought was there is a need to come up with a test that will at the same time detect if these are present and then identify them so that the physician or the healthcare giver now knows exactly what to treat. Because if they don't know, they will treat, and they will be treating the wrong thing. So there will be misdiagnosis, wrong treatment, and that will lead to antibiotic resistance. And that is how, when you look at the situation here, you see that the existing problem was such that, one, when you look in our own setting, Africa and the third world, we have a situation whereby diagnostics is a problem. There are bigger equipments that we cannot handle. There are high technological equipment that we don't have highly trained technicians to handle or to perform. The next problem is the co-infection that we talk about with Ebola and all of uh, uh, bacteria and parasites. The HIV and HCV and uh, hepatitis B, they usually co-infect as well. So when you go to the doctor, it becomes difficult as to, to know whether you are only infected with HIV or you are infected with the others. So you have to be sent back and forth for three different tests. So all of these generated in me the idea of saying, OK, there are these heavy equipment that we cannot handle. The test detects only one, one viruses or bacteria at a time. So what solution do we have for that? I decided then to design this detection system that will be simple to use, will be portable, less expensive, meaning cost-effective, and that will diagnose several pathogens at the same time very rapidly in 10 to 40 minutes, at most an hour, so that the physician can immediately know exactly what to do and immediately intervene. If we had that, the Ebola cases would have been quickly diagnosed and treated, and we would have contained it. And so when you look on your right, you will see the list of what went into producing this test. What simply we do is take the blood, 
or any clinical specimen for that, for that matter, um, depending on the symptoms, and use our preparatory reagents and put that on a simple palm, you know, you see the handheld uh, device. Um, if you go in your laboratory, you look at a PCR machine, it's very heavy, you need two persons to, to carry it. This is a simple machine. That's our first generation prototype. That machine then will give us the results producing if the patient had any one of those diseases, you see them listed there, HIV, hepatitis C, Ebola, malaria, tuberculosis, typhoid, if they have any one of those, it will detect them and distinguish them. The second generation prototype that we are, are working on is much superb, faster, and will be in real time. Those data we cannot show now because we haven't published. So this is how simple it is that you can detect, if you see the white lines, those who run gels, you know you, you have detected the virus. Because most time is in, how can you prove it? These are the proof. You see HIV, two of that being detected, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, dengue, and West Nile viruses, just to show you an example. And then we send in a specific detector and say, go and detect only HIV. And you see the bottom, the three tubes are showing, showing HIV. Same thing with this. You see the different colors of detection, and that's how they're distinguished. We say we detect in 40 minutes, 10 to 40 minutes, and we show the higher time. You see the white line just starting at 40 minutes. And the other issue is publication. There are hurdles. Believe in yourself as an entrepreneur, because you will have to write up your books, do things. When it was time to publish, we were asked, where do you want to publish your work? What I did was to send it to one of the other ordinary papers. And when that happened, they refused it. And I said, we send it to Nature. We send it to Nature, and it was accepted. Why, where are we now? We have filed our intellectual property. Uh, we have nine patents filed, two are pending. Uh, we have pilot clinical studies that are, that are scheduled to be done in Liberia and Sierra Leone. We have our scientific publications, which are verification of our method and in innovation. Uh, we have validated it. The concept is proven. The legal status of the company is established, and we are now going through certain regulatory engagement. So that's the role we have taken to reach this space as entrepreneur. And at the present time, we are looking at what? Impacting society by empowering healthcare workers, by immediately identifying these viruses, enabling epidemiological surveillance. This is our team, as you are seeing there. We are now at the stage of second generation prototype production. It is where we now need funding in order to move forward from this stage to the next stage. If we can do that, this is an invention that is going to impact society. Not only Liberia, not only Africa, but the rest of the world because of the amount of diseases it covers. So these are the challenges we are faced with as entrepreneurs. I have shown you some of the hurdles, some of the good things, the bad things that happen along the way, and you've seen where we have reached, and that's our roadmap. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, Doctor, for that fine, fine bioscientific analysis. You know, there's one person who can speak more or longer than a politician, and that is a passionate scientist. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we literally have 20 minutes remaining of the session, and uh, I will hand over to the panel which leaves each panelist less than five minutes to each sort of give their perspectives. So if we can all kindly be cognizant of time. Thank you very much. Otherwise, if you see me start crawling up on the stage, you know it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> Over to you. This one on. Oh, I want to I wanna kick it. I kick it off with a quote from uh, Elias Zerhouni, who's an Algerian-born 
American physician that uh, was the director of the NIH until 2008. He made a statement, uh, it is the responsibility of those of us involved in today's biomedical research enterprise to translate the remarkable scientific innovations we are witnessing into health gains for the nation. And I think we can speak of all our nations. At no other time has the need for a robust bi-directional information flow between basic and translational scientists been so necessary. So um, I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to um, say a little bit about uh, what are the key issues they see in terms of uh, that's hampering uh, uh, translation of research and technology, well, re science and, and research and development in, in Africa into uh, practical reality, the commercialization, and um, then also uh, some, some thought on the structures and the support and the things that we need to do to, to resolve some of those issues. So I think I'll start on the far side, um, Professor Wallach. Thank you. To keep it. Do you hear me? Okay. To keep it brief, um, I'm just here basically to represent a, a few different organizations. Um, I was sent representing Stanford Medical School who developed a translational medical research program called Spark and Biodesign. And I'm happy because of time, rather than trying to now to explain it all, to meet with anyone who wishes to meet with me and I can go into more detail about how that operates. Um, I'm also here carrying the message from Stanford and Australia that we want to help you develop in your countries your ecosystem and your success. Um, hearing the previous speaker, I agree that it can't be a situation. It's true for Australia as well. Every able scientist finds a good idea and then runs to the U.S. or Europe to uh, develop it. That won't help develop the economy that everyone's looking for. So our goal as a consortium, which now represents 51 universities from 15 countries from around the world, is that we are an altruistic group of uh, countries and universities aiming to help solve global health problems, like the one you just heard about. So we, um, we're changing the paradigm, very much so, and are here to facilitate. Um, the other thing that I could mention that Australia wishes to do, and we're starting to do with WITS in Johannesburg, is to build collaboration and to build uh, programs that will help develop our students and our staff in the area of entrepreneurship and in general. So again, um, I'm here to talk about that with anyone who wishes to pursue it. I've already spoken to one potential PhD student who was sitting behind me. And uh, we are keen to make available to you our expertise um, and to work together with you because, at least from my personal perspective, I see this as a great opportune time in Southern Africa to build what I believe can be a very vibrant and successful entrepreneurial culture. And uh, that's um, what we want to do with you. And the last thing I'll say to be clear is that um, we all struggle in this business, even Stanford. It's not that you uh, have this struggle, we all do. And our aim is to work together to solve uh, the greatest human health problems. Uh, and that will only come about through a network and that's what we are establishing through a global Spark community. So that's my message. Thank you. Um, I think I'll just, from uh, Namibia's perspective, paint to the, the audience the difficulties that um, researchers can, uh, can experience in uh, taking their research products to market and how Namibia has tried to address this issue. First and foremost, uh, more often than not in uh, various African countries, the regulatory, regulatory frameworks and the policies are simply not there to support uh, research and development and innovation. The conducive regulatory uh, environment is a prerequisite for any R&D to flourish in a country. So having identified that in Namibia, we, um, we passed the R&D policy in 1999, followed by a, a R&D Act in 2004, and subsequently followed by some supportive policy policies that support innovation and technology development, uh, whether it be in uh, biotechnology or any other technology. 
Um, with that being said, we've also infused um, innovation into our national development plans by making it a target to achieve the 80th position on the Global Innovation Index uh, by the year 2022, a position which is currently occupied by Kenya and for which we are vying. Um, having said that, we also at the same time, parallel to that, uh, knew that we had to uh, establish programs and execute them because we are already a number of years behind in terms of innovation and technology development. So what becomes important is the strategic partnerships that we have to uh, engage in with uh, networks such as SunBio, um, other uh, funding agencies in various countries. So this is what we are doing pragmatically whilst we were developing the policy and, and now we are at the stage of really implementing it. One of the other key things is R&D um, uh, equipment and technical expertise to run this equipment, something which was also alluded to by the presenter, is very often missing in many of our African contexts. So attracting funding and setting up this R&D infrastructure it becomes key in, in, in driving a, a, a innovation agenda, which is in the medical sector, for instance. So in that regard, we also had to craft an infrastructure strategy, and once again, with the assistance with partners, uh, at a stage where we want to implement it. Uh, so key things basically is strategic partnerships are important in uh, driving innovation, uh, especially in technical or technological areas, and and a policy environment that is supportive and conducive is, is key from our learnings. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to actually start by agreeing with uh, w almost everything that Doug B has said, because I actually happened to be one of a winner of our Innovation Prize for Africa. So, um, but from from the foundation perspective, I, I wanted to outline about four key points that we have identified as um, the really the challenges that innovators that we have been working with across Africa seem to agree on as being the bottleneck towards taking the innovation from lab to market. The number one, and they're not in the order of importance by the way, but the number one is, is it has something to do with weak ecosystems Within where there's no smart money or adequate funding and other uh, support that are needed along the, the journey of the innovation. And also the innovators are you know, taking, you know, taking innovation along the value chain. So as you know, everyone talks about the, the, the value of death, and this is very true. Currently, what we see in Africa, there are quite a lot of innovation hubs that are machining, like if you go on the website, every day there's a new one that's popping up. They're either incuba incubators or accelerators, but where we're not seeing a lot of uh, you know, uh, intervention is actually those innovators who have benchmarked their innovations. They actually went through the acceleration program, but they need that funding to prove the concept so they can attract VCs. So that basically leads to the, you know, this issue of, of death value. So the other issue is, is it has something to do with um, basically what we have across Africa is um, when you innovate in, the Afri in the South Africa, maybe you have a SIDEC as your market, but most of innovators have issues scaling in different regions. And this basically has something to do with the laws we already have um, on the continent whereby an innovator is uh, forced to focus on their local markets, which means they're really missing out because if you, you know, the rest of the world is looking at Africa as one market. So when they come and set up in South Africa, it's because they see the potential of going to Botswana, Namibia, Tanzania, and why not Senegal? So why can we not do it among ourselves? So this is really about setting up a framework at the level probably of NEPAD. I think NEPAD can facilitate this, but this goes all the way to basically African Union. So we can continue to talk about comp competing on a global scale, but if we can't actually not allow our home main innovation to be scaled across African markets, then we still have a long way to go. So the other point is about um, the need to build the skill set needed to understand that um, you know on an innovation journey you need you need different players. 
probably someone who created a product is not necessarily the same one who's going to take it to the market. So you need a marketer. You need inventor and you need a marketer. Of course, um, most of you are probably working in institutions where this is provided, but maybe that's not an accurate assumption. But I know, at least from my small knowledge of uh, South African innovation ecosystem, which is, is actually well developed in the comparison to, to the rest of the continent, this is the case. You have a place where you can go and get some support. When you have an idea, you have a taking up innovation hub next door. Um, but in the many other African markets, actually, you don't really have uh, this, this strong ecosystem where you can go and get someone to help you structure your business. So um, I guess here I'm speaking to inventors in the room to also be humble and understand, uh, yes, you invent something. It's very good. You have identified a solution to a problem. But it's pr probably important to understand you need someone to help you raise your baby. Take your product to the market. Get a marketer to work with you. So this requires tr trust. And this is something that I think um, many you know, innovators struggle with to say, OK, can I trust her to take my innovation to the market? What if they can steal my idea? So I hear this quite a lot. And I think we need to uh, unpack this whole narrative about stealing innovation. It's not as um, you know, black and white as we, we tend to paint it. And then there's a question of, rev, you, know, you know, proposing solutions that are very relevant to actually addressing the local challenges. Again, the discussions from the morning, I think we're all speaking the same language. We don't want just um, product uh, or services that just look sexy. We have a lot of program to, program, problem to solve here on the continent. So what's needed is basically to look at around and see in the health sector, what are the number one you know, challenges the Ministry of Health here in South Africa is struggling with in Botswana, in Namibia, across Africa? So as, as researchers, scientists, can we actually be the ones proposing those solutions? Because I, I guess maybe I'm naive, but I'm convinced if the scientists could come up with these solutions that are you know, helping those ministry ministers of health address their challenges, perhaps the funding issue could also be addressed because this could trigger alignment on the national budget whereby there is an amount dedicated towards actually making sure that those innovations are utilized towards the, uh, solving those challenges in employment on the continent. Um, lastly, this, a, a the last one I wanted to, to mention is a challenge that maybe is not again uh, a challenge in South Africa, but for sure it's a challenge in many other countries across the continent. It's an issue of clarity around ownership. So m many universities in, in Africa still don't have a clear IEP policy. So I'm a researcher at an institution. If I invent a solution, Am I allowed to actually create a spin-off? If I do, what's my share? What's the share of the institution? So those are the things that um, somehow uh, lead some scientists to just focus on the understanding the problem and then leaving the other part to people who, who understand how to navigate this um, bureaucracy. So what we're doing at the foundation is really to raise those questions by uh, using our Innovation Prize for Africa platform, where we every year we reward the top innovators, and we make sure that we give them a platform to share their understanding from their perspective of what they need, because they're doing their share, and they need us to help, you know, unlock their potential by facilitating this lab to market journey. So uh, the prize is hosted by a different country every year. And uh, there, there is a, a forum to uh, meet with the potential investors, but also is hosted by the, usually by the president of the, the country. And this really allows this dialogue between a different key sector in innovation ecosystem. So to have people from academia, from uh, um, policy makers, from civil society and investors, really understanding once, yes, Africans are innovating, Yes, Africans are capable to solve 
not only African challenges, but actually the world class, the, the world challenges, but what they needed all of us to work together to make sure those products are hitting the market. Thank you very much. I, I really agree with what Paulina said. She's made some excellent points, and I'll just try to add a few um, and keep it short. Um, and mine will focus more on, on intellectual property. So as Pauline noted, um, there, there is a lot of innovation on the continent, but there's not a lot of widespread knowledge about intellectual property, um, how to obtain it, how to strategically use it. Um, very few patent attorneys across the continent, and even in South Africa, there are only around 100 patent attorneys, which I was shocked <laughs> that there were so few. Um, and the IP laws don't actually, in many cases, favor um, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in, in terms of, of fees and a variety of other their, um, uh, aspects. So what we see if you look internationally, if you look at statistics on patents, um, very few patents being granted on the, uh, on the African continent. Around 1% of worldwide patents were granted in Africa in 2014, and only 10% of those were um, granted to domestic applicants. So most of them were um, granted to foreign applicants. And that's not because, again, of a lack of innovation, but a lack of knowledge, access to the system, and, and funding, of course, being a, a problem as well. Pauline had mentioned um, issues around structuring a business, ownership, um, how to strategically, it, it, the strategy is very important when it comes to IP. You might have something that's new, but is it really worthwhile to obtain a patent on it, figuring that out? Or are there other kinds of IP that would be more um, beneficial or that you need to use uh, together? Um, is this some kind of a process where it would make more sense to keep it as a trade secret, um, depending on the life cycle of the, project, of the product? That's something to think about. And how can you use trademarks? Um, and how can you use non-traditional trademarks? Um, we see in the United States in terms of pharmaceuticals using the color of a pill, protecting that by trademark. Um, people getting uh, trademarks on smell and, and sound, all kinds of things, thinking a little more broadly about how you can protect against competition in the marketplace. Industrial design, another area that's um, growing. So if you think about medical devices and um, even packaging, um, how you can uh, creatively protect it. Um, there are also, we see changes in, in it's particularly in terms of pharmaceutical development and large pharmaceutical companies wanting less risky um, targets. And so that puts more pressure on university inventors. A lot of the research is being done in universities, and universities normally are not set up so much to do the clinical testing, but we're seeing more pharmaceutical companies wanting the de-risking, some of that de-risking to have taken place. Um, they, they like targets like, uh, you might have heard of the drug Sovaldi, um, Sofosbuvir, um, for treating hepatitis C. And that was actually an Emory spin out pharmacet uh, company, took the drug through uh, clinical testing. Gilead bought it for like $11 billion, only had to finish the last part of the clinical testing, and then made like $15 billion the very next year. And the pricing, of course, is very controversial, but um, the fact that pharmacet uh, took some of the early risk by doing the, the clinical um, testing, made it much more attractive. But many startups don't have the funding necessarily to, to uh, and, and need a partner to um, be able to obtain that kind of funding to do the clinical testing. Um, to quickly move on to a potential or some promising uh, developments or solutions and things that that countries in the region can do. I'm very encouraged by some initiatives that the South African IP office, for example, is taking. Um, they've partnered with WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, in this new um, Inventors Assistance Program. And this is a program they hope to deploy by the end of the year. They're one of the pilot countries um, that will provide pro bono patent assistance to small entities individual inventors, um, there's a cap on a turnover for the companies in a year, for example, and there has to be commercial potential in the um, innovation, but that could be a huge help. There also is a possibility of um, helping in terms of filing internationally because that's something that 
um, as Pauline also mentioned, we don't always think about foreign markets, which foreign markets are going to be most important and what kind of protection you need to get there, um, as well as looking at things beyond utility patents but utility models that depending, on, again, on the life cycle of the product, um, it's much less expensive to obtain, much faster to obtain, and can provide protection sometimes in tandem with um, a utility patent. Mm. Um, the, something else that South Africa is doing, uh, planning for the future to bring back patent agents. So right now, one of the reasons why there's so few patent attorneys is because it takes so long and it's so hard to become a patent attorney. Patent agents wouldn't necessarily have to have a legal degree, and that should hopefully create more, um, a, a, a more dispersion of knowledge and more competition in the marketplace and the ability for inventors and startups to access this kind of expertise that they need. Um, they're also planning to Im uh, implement reduced filing fees for small entities. This is something that we've had in the United States you know, forever, but, but in a lot of countries haven't done that, and that's something that would also facilitate translating um, inventions into innovations in the marketplace. So I'll stop there. <coughs> So firstly, thank you for the opportunity and especially for the inspiring um, story Dr. Nyan presented at the beginning. I, I want to um, frame my remarks by starting with a brief case study, um, a little bit different uh, to Dr. Nyan's, but also in um, the field of um, diagnostic testing. Um, and so the story is about uh, tuberculosis and laser cutters. I'm an engineer, so please forgive me if I get some of the science and the terminology wrong. Um, but um, several years ago, Next Generation Technology was introduced that could bring testing for tuberculosis down from a four to six week culturing process to a two hour molecular diagnostic test. And that was um, a, a huge change and a, and a huge shift in how um, TB was being diagnosed and going back to finding solutions um, for local problems, and the IPA will know about this particular one. You know, a TB is a huge problem in, in many developing countries, and it's not particularly useful if a patient goes back into their community for four or six weeks before they're diagnosed with TB because there's a huge risk of spreading it. And so um, the problem with this technology was that there was equipment being um, deployed to do these tests, but the, there was no way of actually independently verifying the, the uh, assuring the quality of the tests. Were, was the equipment working correctly? So um, at WITS, we had Professor Connor who deals with these bugs in a very, very special laboratory um, that I don't even understand what all goes on in there. Um, and he managed to find a way of producing lots of bugs of different strains and making sure that he's killed them completely. Apparently, that's called inoculation. Um, Professor Scott from um, Molecular and Cell Bar... Uh, sorry, from um, Molecular Medicine and Hematology came up with a way of counting these bugs and being able to deposit them on a little paper card so that it would mimic a sample that you would put into one of these machines. And what was born was a product that could then um, undertake an independent quality assurance test of this um, testing equipment. Um, and then what happened was Professor Scott was very excited about this, and a whole lot of um, sites in South Africa uh, uh, deployed it, and suddenly other countries and um, uh, health departments and programs from other countries approached them and said, well, can we have it? And before they knew, to, knew it, they were running a little business inside their research program. Um, Professor Scott also uh, decided to branch out a little bit. She went into programs like the um, Gap Bar Science Program. She applied for the Innovation Prize for Africa and actually won a Social Innovation Award there. Um, and I said to her, well, do you want to be the MD of this company? Because you're saying you need an operations manager. I think what you need is an MD to run the company and we'd better get this business out of your research program. So you've got to decide what you want to do. And she decided to remain in research. So we found um, Dean Schur, a biomedical engineer who then took the company forward and it's currently quite successful. So now you'll ask where does the laser cutter come in? 
well, being a biomedical engineer, Dean um, developed and, and basically re-engineered a laser cutter to cut these cards, to deposit the spots on these cards, and so was able last year to ship more spots um, to more than 25 countries than they did in the five years previously. And so the question then is, what is our role as a tech transfer or innovation support function within an institution, and how do we work with those of you who are researchers, with uh, Dr. Nyan, to support that process? Well, we provide support in whatever way that is required. We try and identify and understand the value proposition. We try and analyze what the market opportunity is. We raise funds. We help to build the team, as we did in the case of SmartSpot, by bringing those players together. We try and find partners. We help negotiate the deals. And we try and inspire more and more researchers to do this through showing them the role models, um, as I think has been done um, very effectively today. And we also have to look after the underlying intellectual property and make sure the patents, et cetera, are in place. Because in biotechnology, typically, if you don't have a patent, you're already compromised because it takes so much investment and so much time to get the product to market that nobody is going to want to invest that amount of energy and money unless they have some kind of monopoly to recoup their investment, at least for a limited period of time. Some of the key takeaways that I want to leave you with um, in terms of what we've learned in our journey and, and that comes out of SmartSpot is firstly, innovation is multidisciplinary. Break out of your immediate scientific domain. Okay, go and speak to other people. Go and speak to engineers about your biohydrogen reactor or whatever it is that you're working with. This is really, really important because almost no innovation happens purely in that discipline. If nothing else, go and speak to business people and most certainly go and speak to people in the market. Go and hold, this is my latest mantra, go and hold 10 interviews, at least, with people in the market via Skype to Europe or in person down the road from where you, your lab is. Go and speak to people in the market to understand whether there really is a problem that needs to be solved. A lot of it is about timing. Um, this next generation equipment was rolled out. The South African uh, Health Department was very eager to make sure that everything was working well. The scientists seized that opportunity, found the funding for it. And by the way, they didn't get venture capital funding. They got donor funding for it, and they rolled out this product. Um, you have to plan around your innovation, but you have to be open to changing that plan. And those who have read The Lean Startup, um, even the lean startup, which talks about pivoting your business, it doesn't say you don't plan. It's just a particular kind of plan and experiment that you run in order to understand what will be the business model behind your invention. Um, last but not least, in terms of the takeaways, it's all about the team. It is all about the people. It's all about the people. <laughs> It's really, really important that the people have the right attributes um, because they often don't have all the right skills, but if they have the right attributes, they can learn the skills. And so that's what we look for, is the right kind of person. And when we work with researchers in our environment, I, I find it very difficult to work with a researcher that throws something over the wall and says, please patent this. I like the researcher that comes to me and says, how do we commercialize this? I think I've got something exciting. I want to go and talk to those people. We run behind those researchers and we make sure that we support them in whatever way we can because they have to lead the way. The scientist initially must lead the way. They may not be the MD of the company ultimately, but they have to lead that initial path. And then just in terms of some of the challenges, I think some of it has been touched on patent regimes, frameworks, etc. The surveys we have done in South Africa and in SADC show that the biggest constraint and the biggest challenge is capacity. 
So what we have to do is find the frameworks and the programs and the initiatives that help build capacity. Sandbio is one of those. Um, Sarima runs a number of programs in partnership with governments and donor funders to build capacity. There are many, many ways in which to do that. Mentorship programs, etc. Um, and I think the fact that we're here and that we're engaging and we're hearing from role models is part of building capacity and part of the solution. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, I'd like to make a quick comment about those at the end if we have time, but I'd really like some inter engagement with the audience and the, and the conversation, so I'm hoping there are some questions or comments from the audience for any of the panel members, or if you just want to make a general <coughs> statement. Please just state your name and where you're from, and then one question, please. Anybody? So yeah, I think three questions. So we'll see how far we get. Okay, thank you. I think thank you very much for, for the solutions. But I think we have to have a few minutes. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the solutions that are coming up from the panelists. At least it is answering some of the problems in our countries. Uh, mine is just from the first presenter who was presenting about the diagnostic solutions. Uh, I, I see a lot of, uh, one aspect is the research ethics that is coming up, whereby Africa is now, uh, or the other countries, are taking it, I mean, uh, slowly, whereas it has been proven that it is working, and so on. I don't know how fast it can reach our countries, especially where you can diagnose all these uh, illnesses at a go in our laboratories at a very, very short space of time, and so on. Because if something is working in another country, we need structures that can be put in place to respond to the other countries as soon as possible. We are having a lot of TB, we're having a lot of hepatitis, and in some of our Af African countries, we are not even able to have vaccines against, I mean, uh, hepatitis and so on, and we have a lot of uh, people that are dying. Coming to your heli helicobacter, I mean, uh, bacteria that you were able to diagnose in the stools, again, we are missing a lot uh, and so on in our countries whereby we don't even introduce antibiotics, and those antibiotics sometimes nobody's even diagnosing them in terms of resistance. One of your solutions was to mitigate the resistance against antibiotics. How I wish you could say something a little bit about that because it's really a problem in our African countries. Most of our antibiotics are over the counter. People just go there and say they want 500 and they're given that 500 to use. And I've seen also traditional healers, concoctions, they add antibiotics and so on, and it's really a major problem for our African countries. I wonder how you really mitigated that. Thank, thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. Um, to the first question you asked, the invention itself is still in process of being uh, optimized in the second stage and then before going for commercialization, production and commercialization. So there are a lot of steps that are still in between. I just got several um, requests from some doctors through LinkedIn asking if it's available, if they can bring patients to my clinic. And I'm like, okay, that's the demand first and foremost, but it's not yet available, so just, just to say. The second thing is that uh, uh, if you probably uh, keenly look at the the um, outline that I did, uh, we spoke about early detection, which the invention can do, faster detection, uh, specific detection, because when you can specifically pinpoint the pathogen, you are then able to go in with the target drug. So you're not just going in with a shotgun, because these are the shotgun uh, 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 approaches that lead to the antibiotic resistance. And so once you take these steps, 
And, and those are the things, as a, from a clinician point of view, uh, combining it with a scientific sense that came to my mind. Once you do this, you are able to mitigate, at least that would be a step in mitigating antibiotic resistance because we have that serious problem. Uh, the parasites is the same uh, with, with malaria. You know, you have uh, anti, uh, you know, anti-malaria or resistance against the, the, the anti-malaria drugs. Excuse me, you have resistance from the plasmodium species against the anti-malaria drugs presently. So it's the same situation because they don't know whether they are detecting uh, plasmodium or they are detecting ovale or they are detecting the other species, but they just go in with just this one drug, but then it creates a resistance because it is not targeted for that particular species. So I think those are steps that we can take to do that. Yeah, let me just add to the antibiotic resistance issue, which is very problematic in Western countries like Australia. Um, the problem is getting the pharmaceutical industry to develop new antibiotics, because no matter what we do, we're essentially coming to the end of the antibiotic era, and we have to be prepared for that. One thing Africa can offer is, in fact, an opportunity to develop new antibiotics within the African continent that don't necessarily require the costs and risks involved with a large-scale global antibiotic resistance program. Because most companies find that within a year of developing a new antibiotic, they're useless. And that's the problem. And that's part of the thing as a global community we want to work together on. Uh, and it's becoming what's looked at as a moonshot project. Um, mine is just a comment. Uh, it's just a comment. I think when we have to talk about entrepreneurship, we must go back to the university to see how we are training our students. Our students, they are not trained to be entrepreneurs. Moreover, when they're trained by a professor who hasn't got a clue of what is entrepreneur, there is no way, let me even stand up, there is just no way that that professor is going to encourage these students that he or she is training. When the students will come with an idea that, you know what, I've got a dream, how about doing this and this and this? Because the professor is not an entrepreneur, you know what is going to be the answer? That this thing is not going to fly. You have already killed the poor child, you know, business because of, you actually didn't allow that. So I'm saying this because I'm working for the university and I know that we can have all these debates, but we must go back and find what are the cause. And the cause is from the university. How are we training our students? That is the problem. We must not share about it. We must really talk about it. It's about time that the curriculum be changed. It's about time that we don't only talk about entrepreneur at the postgraduate level. We need to start incorporating it at the undergraduate level if we want to take Africa further. Thank you. Yes. I just want to give a quick anecdote because I so, so hear what you're saying and I'm very passionate about it as well. Um, we have seminars every now and then with particular student groups, and this was a chemical engineering group, and before the, the industry innovator spoke, I said, how many people in the room think they're going to run their own company one day? They're going to start their own business one day? And I had two put up their hand. 45 minutes later, I asked the question again, and there were eight. That's what we've got to do. We've got to inspire people, despite the fact that there may be people that they engage with that just don't see entrepreneurship as a way forward. That's what we've got to do. I'm now advertising this. It's an urge because there will be a call, I know, for FIMBIO. And really, they must expect a lot of projects from the university. And they are going to struggle because of the way we, including myself and I, training them at the postgraduate level. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll speak as the professor representing the bad guy. <laughs> um, you don't know me that well, but um, I do exactly what um, most professors don't do, and that is I reverse the pyramid and often put the student on top and us at the bottom. We have an obligation to train you and your generation. And um, I myself have developed and been running bioinnovation courses for students 
around the world, and you're welcome to join the next one in Berlin. I invite you um, to get you to become entrepreneurial. It's not enough. Yes, the tech transfer people can encourage you, but we have to work with you. You can't do it on your own. And we're developing a program with Stanford and others around the world to do exactly what you want. We've so far run it with 1,500 students over the years, and we'd like to increase that number, and we'd like you to get involved with, from Africa, we have sent uh, two students from WITS and one from Zimbabwe to Stanford for training, and we believe that that paradigm shift is on its way, it will take time, and we have to develop career paths for young people who want to become entrepreneurs. I just wanted to add, we, um, we have several entrepreneurship programs at Emory, and what you're saying is absolutely important. It's important not only to inspire students to become entrepreneurs, but to train the other students that are going to work with them and support them. So training, for me, IP attorneys to think about not just saying no, because lawyers tend to be very you know, risk averse, but how can you say yes? How can you help this person accomplish their goals? And being able to talk, that was um, the program that I helped develop between Georgia Tech and Emory. We had law students, PhD science and engineering students, business students working on teams, focusing on how to, to commercialize the PhD student's project. And, and they learned how to talk to each other. They learned how to think more entrepreneurially. And there's a program actually that happens here um, it's been happening in South Africa. It's a collaboration between Emory and the um, ANDI, the African Network for Drug and Diagnostic Development, um, which does kind of a mini thing. So I'm happy to talk to you about that. Hopefully that'll be later this summer. Um, I'm not sure um, how the teams are being put together, but there will be teams that will be um, from different countries in Africa who will be learning commercialization and entrepreneurship um, in an intensive uh, week-long setting. Um, yeah, we're going to have one more question at the back there. Unfortunately, the other questions we're going to have to take for lunch or discuss with the panel offline. Good day, everyone. My name is Ngozi. Um, the last person that made comments uh, took words from my mouth, but she made it as a comment. But I want to ask it as a direct question. As a young scientist, for instance, while you are developing maybe at your honors level or at your BS level, you still it's possible you have ideas coming to your mind. Do you, what is the pathway to developing? Do you wait until you get to, to, to doctoral level or post-doc level? <laughs> is it possible to, you know, to, to encourage people while we are sitting here on this uh, gathering? What is actually the pathway? That you have nothing boiling in you. You know you want, it's going to help the, the community. You need it to be developed. But you are still a very young scientist. How do you move up to the ladder to get somebody to hear what you want to do and to make something out of it. So what is the path, actually? My question is, what is the path? How do we go about it? So I can, I can provide some comments. I don't know if Dr. Nyan wants to also comment on that. Um, from my perspective as, as a tech transfer facilitator and innovation facilitator, there's no age restrictions. There's no degree restrictions. If somebody has a good idea with a great value proposition, we work with them. It doesn't matter what domain they're from, it doesn't matter what level of degree they have. It's about the idea and it's about who they are as a person, their passion and commitment to making it happen. In some areas of science, you may need to get to PhD level to actually perform the science, but it doesn't mean that that's always the case. And I think, I think people need to say, what is my idea? Has it got a value proposition? Is it a prospective innovation? And then run with it. Yes, I think uh, by and large, that responsibility will have to fall on the principal investigators from my experience because they are the ones who control the labs. They are the ones who decide uh, what project is important and what project is not important. Because in my case, if my principal investigator, uh, Dr. William Como, may his soul rest in peace, had not encouraged me during the helicobacter pylori thing, if he had discouraged it, we would not have come up with that. But he doubted, but he still supported it. He said, okay, do it. Go ahead, let's see what comes out of it. So the principal investigator, I think, is the gatekeeper. And they should be the one to really encourage the students. See your students like the students I had when I was uh, in the academic arena. 
I take them as my colleagues, as my friends, you know, we, we, and that's how we did a summer class just uh, two weeks, I mean, two, two days ago. Same thing, interact with them as equals, because there's no big idea, there's no small idea. All ideas are really equal until you can see what they produce. So the PIs are the gatekeepers. They really need to step up. Um, thanks for I, I'd like to. Sorry. I'd like to thank the panel and the, the participation of the audience, and I hope we can actually, I think there's a lot more that we want to say and that we can say than we, we I think we should take it offline uh, into the lunch and, and through the rest of the day. I think that the, the today and tomorrow is not just for networking as well, it's for also talking about solutions. But I wanted to just, there were a few key things that really uh, struck me um, uh, from, from all the, uh, the panel members and Dr. Nyan. From, from him I heard um, team diversity, the value of that and different perspectives and hearing different people and also perseverance came through. Um, you know, you can expect a lot of obstacles no matter what you try, but I think, you know, it's, it's pushing through that will get you there in the end. Then uh, from Professor Wallach, we heard um, the importance and the uh, thank you for the audience member that brought the same point up, the, the importance of the mindset in the educational uh, uh, arena, the academic arena, but also education in translation and in entrepreneurship. And that needs to spread a lot more, more widely. Um, Vincent uh, spoke about supportive policies and resources and people in many cases shoot those things down and they see them as bureaucratic and you know the government produces another policy document but really you, I, I don't think you can find a country or a society where, where there's a healthy innovation ecosystem without supportive policies so I think the important thing there is to work with these uh, work with the government and help them to develop the right policies that will support uh, the innovation ecosystem. Um, Pauline mentioned something that we don't talk about nearly often enough, and that is, that is collaboration within Africa. We actually have so many trade barriers and, and infrastructure barriers and knowledge sharing barriers uh, within the continent, and all of us go to other places to talk to other people about uh, our problems, and I think that's something with it we should also focus on. Uh, Sanbio, Sanbio, Sarima, and these types of initiatives, all initiatives to try and overcome that, and I think there's been a lot of progress in the last 10 or 15 years. It's really encouraging. Um, then uh, Professor Bagley uh, spoke about a few things um, that are also important in terms of intellectual property strategy, um, but also IP laws that are not favorable to small companies. Now, in South Africa, we just had a change of president um, who promised to actually make some changes to the laws to support small companies, and I think uh, we, we might see a few of those things, but again, that, that relates to policy and the importance of, of the right policy and, and, and things like inventor assistance programs, um, support for small businesses, um, reduced filing fees. Those are things that, those are tangible things that all African countries, all of us can do to, to improve innovation. And then um, Ella spoke about a few things, but the key thing that stood out for me, and that's also... Um, uh, f uh, an amazing role model like, like Dr. Nyan. It's about role models. Um, if we make more of those visible, because actually there are a lot of success stories in Africa and I think that's also what the Africa Innovation Foundation uh, tries to highlight. But the more we celebrate those, you talk about how do you get the young people at university interested in these things, it's by seeing actual role models uh, coming from their own communities that have made it and, and, you know, and them being in, uh, able to interact with those people. So I think... Uh, I, I wish you all for the rest of the two days, and let's continue the discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sean Mwolman, and uh, thank you so much to our fantastic, our very dynamic panel.